If you don't have one now, you probably will have one in a decade, say the phone makers, as the price comes down into the range of other high-tech toys. Liquid crystal displays, 14 separate instrument readouts, English or metric. Your engine oil pressure is low. Back in the 80s, automotive technology was in the dark ages, at least when compared to the mobile computers we drive today. Many of us back then, including me, thought the new tech was cool but our parents often hated it, and longed for the days when the most complex feature in the car was the AM radio. This is my top 10 of the most innovative, or just plain weird, automotive gadgets in the 1980s. Test drive V864. Only your Cadillac dealer has it. Number 10, in-dash CD player. Just like how 8-track players became the best thing to have in your car in the 1960s, only to be unseated by the cassette player in the 1970s. The best seat in the house is in your car. When you get into a Craig, the road-rated receiver. The compact disc was the perfect example of space-age computer tech that helped define the 1980s. With Sony releasing the first commercial CD player in the U.S. in early 1983, it was only a matter of time before one could work in a car. Pioneer debuted the first in-dash CD player in 1984, and Sony introduced the first in-car CD changer in 1986. With most cars in the early 80s coming standard with just an AM radio, or if you really splurged, an FM radio as well. Aftermarket stereos were a big business to get cassette and CD players into our cars. It wasn't until 1986 that Lincoln offered the first factory installed CD player in the Lincoln Town Car. Developed in a joint venture between Ford and JBL, the CD player could be added to the 12-speaker audio system at a time when some cars were lucky to have more than one speaker. However, despite CD sales overtaking cassettes, car manufacturers continued to offer both options, long into the 90s and even the early 2000s. My 2004 Toyota Solara convertible still had a cassette tape player, along with a 6-CD changer, which they managed to fit into the dash, unlike some car CD changers that were relegated to the trunk. Although the last factory installed car cassette player was as late as 2010 in the Lexus SC430. This was the last car ever made to be fitted as standard with a cassette player. CDs have taken far longer to leave our cars. Although most automakers started phasing them out in the late 2010s, some have continued to offer them, especially models that are favored by older customers, as they still have large CD collections. Although I can't remember the last time I actually listened to anything on a CD, it's impressive that if you look hard enough, you may still find this 80s tech in a car today. Number 9. Car Phones My car phone. If you grew up in the 80s and wanted to make a phone call from your car, you could only hope your parents were wealthy enough to afford a car that had its own phone. The idea of a car phone existed long before the 1980s, when Bell created its first wireless network in 1946. Back then, automakers had to rely on the phone company to install the phones as aftermarket accessories. By the 1970s, these car phones were far outnumbered by CB radios, which although were a lot more affordable, your conversations weren't exactly private. Yes sir, Roscoe sir, I got my ears on, my eyes open and my nose pointed due north sir. In the late 70s and through the 1980s, BMW and Mercedes-Benz started offering car phones in their cars. Just like today, image mattered in the 1980s, so there was even a market for fake car phones all just to make you look cool alongside other drivers. This is what the cellular car phone has spawned, a phony car phone. Although the first official cell phone call was made on April 3, 1973, trying to make it work with the FCC took another decade, with a Dynatac phone costing nearly $4,000, a huge sum for the mid-80s. The term brick phone was spot on, and their bulky size and huge price limited their market, leaving the car phone to only be available in high-end luxury cars into the 1990s. However, by the mid-90s, with cell phones shrinking in size and price, having a phone that was tied to your car was no longer the status symbol it once was, as you looked a lot more cool talking on a phone that you could take anywhere. Whenever I see a car phone, I can't help wondering whether the person who owns it is important or wants everyone else to think he's important. So this may make you think, didn't automakers realize back then how distracting it could be to drive and talk on the phone at the same time? Instead, it was just the opposite. They actually encouraged it as the bigger appeal back then was to show everybody that you could talk on the phone in your car. Today there is a small but dedicated following of old tech lovers who have tried to get their 30 plus year old car phones to work on modern cell networks. But even if they can't get them to actually make calls, they can still look cool driving down the road holding a classic 80s corded handset, even at the risk of getting pulled over by the cops 
for distracted driving. I'll see you soon. Over and out. Number eight, headlight wipers. Here's another car feature which, like the car phone, may have been more popular as a status symbol than its original intended purpose. The idea of putting little wipers, along with washers, on the headlights first became popular with cars from Volvo and Saab, as they were made in Sweden, where harsh winters made it easy for snow, ice, and salt to build up on the headlights. However, when these cars were imported to the US, they often sold in regions where heavy snow wasn't really a factor. These little wipers were typically only on cars with glass headlights, which was an important requirement, as headlights with plastic lenses could more easily get scratched if any salt got behind the wipers. Not to mention that most drivers would forget to replace them as they got worn, so the wipers themselves over time could cause damage to the headlights. As headlight design became more aerodynamic, the wipers became far less relevant, as just washers could do the job, since the act of driving would blow the water off the headlights. These little wipers are now nearly impossible to find replacements, making them more of a liability on old luxury cars than a benefit. But as long as you didn't actually use them, they still look cool, in a retro kind of way. Number 7. Power Antennas Anyone who once owned a car from the 80s probably remembers having an antenna sticking up out of one of the fenders. Although many cars back then only had an AM radio, if you were lucky enough to also have FM, you definitely needed an antenna. The problem was, they were flimsy and easy to break, especially in automated car washes. Although some automakers would later figure out ways to incorporate the antenna into the windshield or the rear glass, the alternative was to have the antenna retract when not in use. Having a power antenna seemed like a cool idea at first, it was also another way to make your car be more special. Of course, none of that mattered when the little motor broke, which was inevitable. Better antennas that didn't require the need to be retracted would gradually replace them by the 1990s, although some cars still had them into the 2000s. Despite that, I'll bet most kids seeing an old car antenna wouldn't even know what it was for. Number 6. Cylinder Deactivation It's the exclusive new V864 fuel injection. This one you might say wasn't lost in the 80s, as many of today's internal combustion cars, most commonly those with V8 engines, incorporate a variation of this feature to save fuel. However, it only has become widespread in the last few years, as the technology needed time to improve from the early attempts to make it work in the 1980s. I also talked about this one in my first sales flop video, as the most notorious example was from General Motors, who called it the V864. GM offered it on all four of their Cadillac models for the 1981 model year, and for three of those models, this V864 was the only engine option. Cadillac advertised that they used state-of-the-art computer processing power to decide on when the conditions were right to activate solenoids that would prevent the camshaft from opening the valves on two or four of the cylinders. A digital display on the dash, called the MPG Sentinel, would tell the driver when the change in cylinder count was in operation. Cadillac bragged that the computer could process 300,000 commands a second and claim fuel economy gains of 15% or more. But this was 1981, and the technology was being pushed far beyond its limits. The software simply couldn't keep up with the demands of the job, and the end result was significant hesitations and far from smooth transitions when switching cylinders on and off, and the lack of smooth power continued when in four or six cylinder mode. It also didn't help that the flawed engine couldn't achieve the economy savings it had claimed. The V864 was pulled from the retail lineup for 1982. Number 5. Infotainment Touchscreens Auto Destruct Sequence Deactivated Okay, yes, of course, every car has these today. But back in the 80s, touchscreen technology was in its infancy, and GM offered two different versions, one for Buick and later one for Oldsmobile. The Buick version came standard in 1988 for the Riviera and Riata Coupes. Its touchscreen controlled all the radio and climate settings, displayed the tachometer and other engine status gauges, included a trip computer, and provided maintenance reminders. Even the fan speed was displayed with an animated fan graphic that would spin fast or slow, depending on the driver's selection. Since the LCD green screen resolution was so poor by today's standards, only a limited number of controls could be displayed at any one time, requiring physical buttons around the screen to switch to different modes. Typical Buick owners of the time, who weren't comfortable with this futuristic technology, hated it so much that both the Riviera and Riata had their dashboards later redesigned to return to old-fashioned buttons and switches. Whereas the Buick touchscreen only showed one color, green, the Oldsmobile Toronado Trofeo for 1989 offered multiple colors for its touchscreen. The Trofeo was an upgrade from the base Toronado, which did not have the touchscreen. The Trofeo touchscreen offered a lot more physical buttons than the Buick version did, but like the Buick version, some of those physical buttons allowed the digital buttons to change from radio to climate controls. For an extra thousand dollars, a lot of money back then, 
The Traveo also offered a car phone, with the touchscreen providing the telephone keypad. The Toronado only lasted through 1992, and GM didn't attempt touchscreens again until most other automakers in the 2010s. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. But Vince, look out! <laughs> Number four, automatic seatbelts. Vince, you still gotta remember to buckle your safety belt. If you never owned a car from the 80s or 90s that had automatic seatbelts, consider yourself lucky. Today's cars typically have 10 or more airbags to help protect everyone in the car. But back in the 70s, airbags were extremely rare and expensive, and seatbelt usage was poor at best back then, with some estimates stating that 20% of drivers or less were buckling up. Well, I'll have to detour the town to get to Kalamazoo. They pass the seatbelt ordinance, but I don't use a seatbelt. So how to get around this problem? Force the driver to wear the seatbelt by trying to automate their operation. Yeah, I'm sure no one ever complained about that. But the idea didn't gain traction in the United States until the Carter administration issued a mandate in 1977, requiring all cars to either have airbags or automatic seat belts by 1983, which would later get pushed to 1987. The automatic belts were the cheaper option by far, so nearly all automakers went with them. Most cars had a shoulder belt run on a track above the door, which would activate when the door was either opened or closed. Open the door and the seatbelt goes on a track, and then you close the door and it goes However, the driver still had to manually latch the lap belt. The whole advantage of the automated shoulder belt was lost here, since most drivers forgot to latch the lap belt. The end result would be more serious injury, as the driver could slide under the shoulder belt. Other cars tried to prevent this by attaching both the shoulder and lap belts to the door. But if the door came open in an accident, the seatbelt became effectively useless. By 1990, enough studies had been done to prove that automatic seatbelts were often more dangerous than not buckling up at all, which further pushed federal requirements for airbags. By 1995, driver's side airbags became mandatory, so the automatic seatbelts disappeared soon after. If you still own one of these cars today, have you figured out how to disable the automatic belts, assuming the motor still works? Number 3. Digital Gauges More and more cars every year are transitioning from analog to digital dashboards, as the technology, not to mention the improved screen resolution, allows automakers much more flexibility on what they can display to the driver. However, in the 70s and before, analog gauges were typically the only option. But in the early 80s, as home computing became the latest fad, digital displays were part of that fad, as it could give the car a more space-age look. Several automakers made this transition to digital displays, not just to provide a better experience for the driver, but also to give it that wow factor. Wow. Wow, I know, I say it louder. Have a great day. Unfortunately, the latter often took precedence over the former, resulting in dashboards that were more confusing and distracting than they were helpful. These digital displays tended to show up more often in sports cars, or otherwise ordinary cars that wanted to appear sporty. But they also showed up in some luxury cars, whose owner typically skewed older, and who preferred simpler analog gauges. By the end of the 1980s, many models which had tried to switch to digital dashboards reverted back to more simple analog gauges by the 1990s. However, for cars that catered to older buyers, some of the big luxury sedans kept the digital speedometer, a feature which has gained a following across many more cars up to this day. Come on, Eddie, get in! Number two, talking cars. I'll drive. But I want to drive. No, I'll drive. I'm the cat. Out of my way, handsome neck. Haven't you ever wished that your car could alert you to a problem by talking to you? Your headlights are on. Well, back in the 80s, your wish could be granted. Thank you. This is an example of a solution looking for a problem. The left door is open. As the idea may have appeared helpful at first, but in practice, it had just the opposite effect. The left door is open. Thank you, Datsun. One of the first examples in a car was brought to market by Nissan, or Datsun as they were known in the U.S. back in 1981. The 81 Maxima could initially only warn the driver that they left their lights on. Lights are on. But it did it by using a recorded voice on a tiny phonographic record. Parking brake is on. Later models like the 300ZX also offered it, and the Maxima had it as late as 1987. Parking brake is on. However, the more well-known version of Talking Cars was the Electronic Voice Alert, or EVA, from Chrysler. Please check your engine coolant level. Who offered it on several cars starting in 1983, such as the New Yorker, LeBaron, Fifth Avenue, Town & Country, and even in the Dodge Daytona clone, the Chrysler Laser. Chrysler creates a hot new laser to melt the competition. Unlike the Nissan version, Chrysler utilized a synthesized computer voice, which was probably a cheaper option. The technology needed to synthesize the human voice wasn't all that new at the start of the 1980s, as Chrysler even used the same Texas Instruments tech 
that you could find in the kids' speak and spell. But what Chrysler didn't expect is how quickly the buying public would grow to hate it. I don't intend to drive around in a car that talks back to me. So much so that some even tried removing fuses just to deactivate it. La presión de aceite está baja. This forced Chrysler to later add shutoff switches in the glove box. Please fasten your seat. Oh, that, yeah, that's what it is. And then eventually just dropped the feature altogether by 1988. GM also offered a similar feature in two Oldsmobile models, the Toronado Caliente. The park brake is not fully released. And the Olds 98. But it was only available during the 1984 and 85 model years. The project behind the GM version was called DigiTalker and sounded a lot like the Chrysler version, but offered a lot more info to the driver as to what could go wrong if they ignored the problem. The charging system is not functioning properly. Have it repaired as soon as possible. Driving with this condition will cause reduced performance of electrical devices and eventual loss of engine operation. It almost sounds to me like an attempt to avoid liability. I didn't do it. Nobody saw me do it. There's no way they can prove anything. Number one, pop-up headlights. I'm Mia. If you've ever seen any of my other episodes on cars that had pop-up headlights, you know that this was my favorite car feature back when I was a kid. It was my goal to eventually own a car that had them, or at least had the headlights concealed in some way, like my 1990 Pontiac Sunbird. The idea for pop-up headlights can be traced back as far as 1936, such as these on the Cord Westchester sedan. Pop-ups became more popular in the 60s, followed by concealed headlights that were common in the 70s. Whereas the concealed headlights that didn't pop up were strictly for style and provided no other benefit. Pop-ups had a purpose for sports cars, to have more aerodynamic shapes. Eventually the idea spread to sedans as well, such as the third gen Honda Accord. Prior to the mid 80s, there were essentially only two shapes for headlights, round or rectangular, neither of which allowed for an aerodynamic front end. Some European models solved that by putting a plexiglass cover over the headlights, but these were illegal in the US starting in 1971, hence the reason some European cars, such as Peugeot or Audi, had very ugly headlamps when imported to the US. Let's move it, dude. What is this? It's a car, man. Did you steal this thing, dude? No, actually, it's a loaner. However, pop-ups were legal and alleviated the aerodynamic concern, although only when the headlights were turned off, as they were the complete opposite of aerodynamic when the lights were on. Once composite headlights got government approval, nearly all cars switched to them, not just to make the car more aerodynamic day or night, but also to eliminate a common fail point. Daytime! Nighttime! We've likely all seen cars with pop-ups that appear to be winking, as the motor on one of the lights has failed. The switch to composite headlights didn't mark the complete end of pop-ups, as some sports cars, like the Corvette, continued to have them into the mid-2000s. But what ultimately killed them was pedestrian crash safety standards, as the headlights sticking up were deemed to cause more injury to pedestrians in the event of a collision. Considering the number of huge trucks we have on the roads today, personally I'd prefer to get hit by a car with pop-ups if I had a choice. Thanks for watching. Driving, speaking simultaneously. If you like this video, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. If you once owned a car from the 80s to mid-2000s that you rarely see today, and would like it featured in a future episode, leave a reply in the comments or contact me at the email shown here. See you next time. Hello? Hey, I'm on my car phone. <laughs> me too. Dad, I'm really going to pee. Not right now, son.